Hi, so today, uh, once again, thanks to Seek Thermal for sending us. This is the Reveal Pro, which is the sort of standalone version using the sensor that we saw in the, the phone um, add on unit. So, this is basically a 320 by 240 imager with their fast frame rate sensor. Now, so there were issues with the frame rate on the phone, so it'd be interesting to see how this improves being standalone. I'm not going to go into like lots and lots of details review wise, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of other reviews, and I'm sure, like me, you're more interested to see what's inside this thing. But I'll just do a very quick overview. First thing you notice, this feels really nice, it feels extremely solid. It's, I think it's a plastic case, but it's got this sort of fake carbon fiber texture. But it's it feels very, very solid, there's not, not a hint of any sort of twistiness here. It's got these sort of nice rubber, inlaid rubber things, so it just feels very, very nice, very solid. You know, it just feels like a really sort of quality, um, quality piece of kit. It comes with this lanyard that you can, you, know, you have to thread it through yourself. The only connector micro USB under there, and that sort of feels reasonably water resistant. I haven't checked to see what they claim as the IP rating on this, but it feels like it's certainly, you know, reasonably splash resistant. Um, on the front we've got the camera, it's also got a built-in um, torch and the torch works regardless of the uh, the on-off state of the um, unit. And it's got two brightnesses and you can actually configure the brightnesses like the low can be 10 to 50% and the high can be 50 to 100% um, so you've got two different brightnesses and in bright mode it's you know it's, it's pretty decent um, light so you know, if you're in a situation where you're, you're rummaging around in the dark looking at fuse boards and so on, that's a useful addition. And to be honest, these days, you know, white LEDs are so cheap, there's almost no excuse for anything that has a battery in it to not have a light in there. You know, any piece of tool that you're, any tool that you might conceivably want to use in a dark place, you know, it's, it's almost a no-brainer just to shove a white LED in there. But they've, uh, they've made a fairly decent um, job of that. On the back there's a couple of holes there which I'm guessing are for like a belt clip, um, I haven't seen any mention of that but uh, that's probably what they, these are for. Um, because it's high frame rate it says sort of subject to US EAR export regulations it says it there, it's also on the box and it appears on the screen. Um, turn on time's not too bad, so hold the button, about sort of 5 seconds or so and bang, there you go. Um, you also you hear the um, the, sort of the clicky um, calibration shutter thing going on. Um, the frame rate, yeah, does does look reasonable. I've not really measured it, but like the phone thing, it, it does still have quite significant lag to it. So if you see sort of, there's probably a little over half a second of lag going on there. Um, but it, other than that, yeah, the, the motion does seem sort of reasonably smooth. It certainly looks, you know, looks better than 9 FPS. It's, I, I'm a little bit too lazy to figure out exactly what it is by um, looking at moving target. But it, yeah, it, fe it feels quite nice. Um, obviously, it's 320 by 240 that way because of the orientation of the display, um, and the, because they they profiled the display window slightly to the body. There's a very small amount of cutoff at the bottom, but I don't think that's really a, a major a major issue there. And um, when you plug the USB in, it enumerates as a uh, mass storage device, so you can just pull the files off. Unlike, for example, the 34, it doesn't act as a UVC video device, as far as I can tell, so it's purely just for pulling the files off. Pretty much what you'd expect for this. Sort of hand. I mean, this is clearly going you know, very much against the, the Fleur C2, which is another sort of small self contained unit. The C2 having 80 by 60 using the lepton, so this is high resolution and high frame rate, but it doesn't have the MSX enhancement that the um, the Fleur C2 has. So yeah, there's no clear sort of yeah one's better than the other. If you're looking for this sort of kit, I think you know you'd probably want to maybe have a look at both of them and just see which one you prefer. But yeah, this one there does have the higher resolution. What it doesn't have, which I think is a bit disappointing compared to this, it doesn't have adjustable lens focus. So once you get in below about 12 inches, it does sort of lose focus. So if you're looking specifically for something for electronic circuit board work, I would say this is almost certainly not the device for you for that. Something like this is probably better. Obviously, you know, you probably could use it with an external lens, but the format of this doesn't really lend itself to that. So, yeah, this is very much a sort of, you know, high-end handyman tool, electrician type thing. You know, it feels fairly rugged. Um, I'm not sure if that's plastic or glass on there, but, it, you know, it feels sort of reasonably rugged. So it's the sort of thing you'd have in your toolbox for looking at, you know, the classic insulation leak, leaks electrical, you know, electrician as opposed to electronics type stuff. 
does m most of the menu functions are pretty much what you expect. One thing that is a bit noticeable is that the um, it it's not as noticeable on camera as it is in real it, it, sort of in person. But some of the fonts look a little bit thin. I think they've maybe picked a font and a font size that's not a, p a particularly good match for the screen resolution. So some of the light vertical line widths seem a little bit inconsistent. So there's just a minor gripe. But some of them are just a little bit difficult to read. Um, and I think maybe going to just a slightly um, bolder font would probably improve that um, in the readability of it. So we've got three buttons on here. There's a menu button which also doubles as your power on off. There's this one which is filters and that, that basically that's all, the, all your different um, colour palettes, that sort of thing you, you might want to change fairly frequently. Um, and the other mode is capture, so you just hit that button it just take, saves the frame. So it's just, quick um, image capture thing. There's what it's slightly confusing, there's one or two things where there's actually more than one way of getting getting to it, but there's a, there's various um, there's a um, software zoom up to times four um, which is I suppose sort of might be sort of useful but it starts getting really blobby if we go up to the full um, full setting um, it does start getting a little bit it's a little bit hard to um, See, so I haven't got, really got much to point it at here, but um, like all the other seats, you do get this sort of slight background noise thing going on, which we've come to you know, expect pretty much from all the seat products. But it's not, it's not too bad. Yeah, it, it is noticeable, particularly when you've got a fairly narrow um, temperature span. There's modes now. There is a, a manual span and level so you can set a specific temperature span and um, range which is, which is good. It's also got normal and full frame and I can't actually figure out quite what the difference is between these. Um, I haven't really looked through the um, and the only documentation that comes with it is this sort of really not very useful bit of paper that just sort of just like very short getting started. It'd be nice if it just had a, just a little bit more information on there instead of these just pointless pictures. Stupid, really. So going back to the menu, reticle that just basically turns the um, temperature display on and off. Of course, you sometimes you don't necessarily want a spot temperature reading to any what you're doing. Emissivity, you've only got four fixed emissivity settings. There's no manual certain manual control for that. But again, for most applications, that's probably not really a big deal. Seat do seem to sort of like to keep things really simple to some extent at the expense of usability. For example, like not having the rotate function on the um, the phone products and you got all the, sort of the normal sort of settings say there's another way of getting into gallery here which seems to be you know, a bit of duplication it's, it's not, not a huge issue really um, temperature you can set degree C degree degree F and again there's another emiss emissivity setting within that so it's there's a bit of duplication there and device power so also power downtime display brightness controls uh, display is very bright. I'll turn the display all really right down. It's still perfectly bright enough. And device. So if you go into flashlight, you can actually set the um, the power levels for the uh, different high and the low. There is actually a, uh, a bug in this menu. The first time you click up and down, it actually goes the wrong way. So that's a 59. If I click up does nothing, then the second time it goes 60, 62, etc. If I now click down, it goes 64, it goes up to 66 and then it starts going down. So again, if I now go to up, it actually goes, it either does nothing or goes the wrong way the first time you press the button. It's a really minor issue and nitpicking, but it's just a minor thing. One thing I have noticed though is that as you get right up to close to 90%, um, you do sometimes get a little bit of flicker like there, you can see that, I'm not sure how well that's coming th coming through on the um, camera, but you get it gets a bit flickery. Now I wonder if that's maybe sort of some coincidence between the PWM they're using for dimming and the actual converter they're using to drive the LED. In fact just looking at the light, that light output, and if we just look at that output, I'm just firing this into a photo diode on, on scope, and if I increase that, you see it's actually getting to a mode where it's, it's almost like it's skipping random pulses. So I think that's probably yeah, sort of something like a PWM versus the um, maybe there's probably a buck, buck or a boost converter driving the LED, or just some sort of sampling 
type issue or some sort of rounding error but it's, it's literally it's, it's, it's a very minor thing but it's at 90 between about 96 and 100 percent you get this slightly flickery thing going on but again that's nitpicking a little bit but uh, just a minor little thing going on there and uh, th th this torch comes on on instantly regardless of whether things on or off so if you turn the unit off the um the torch still torch still works quite happily um what would be nice is yeah okay the, the brightness adjustment is useful but it would be nice to be able to go straight into it so for example when it's on instead of having to go through the menu it might be nice if maybe you just held the torch button down for a couple of seconds and it'll maybe take you straight into a way of adjusting the brightness because i mean at full brightness it is really really bright and i can't think you'd really want it any brighter than that but obviously you've got the, the high and low so you've got a good compromise if you want just a little bit of light that's not going to kill the battery and we'll maybe take a look at what the actual power draw is for that um, once we uh, pull it apart. One other really silly little thing is when you turn it off, it says, please wait. Well, wait for what? Wait for the thing to turn off? Just why? Just turn off. It's just silly, it's pointless, but say the turn on time is fairly uh, acceptable. Obviously, it, it, um, it seems to click, click a little bit more frequently when it's starting from cold, as you expect, as the sort of temperature um, sort of starts to stabilise, but um, yeah, I think that's pretty much covers everything. You know, it's got all the functions you'd you'd expect, and so I'll leave it to uh, other reviews to go into more uh, more detail about the actual performance. But um, no, so the initial feel is yeah, you know, quite a nice unit, it's nice feel, nice nice looking build quality. So I think it's time to uh, see what's inside here. Um, these front screws, these are five-sided, like like a heck, like an Allen key, but with five sides with a security pin in there, um, which seems a little bit overkill. But um, fortunately, it's small enough. I haven't actually got the right driver, but the pin is small enough that I could I just snap the pin out with a um, flat driver, so I can use a standard penta pentalobe driver to uh, get these out. Whereas these these ones look, look like fairly conventional um, Torx drivers. Well, not surprisingly, the first thing we see is a sort of fairly um, chunky battery. Um, it's got a protection board on there, as you'd expect. Let's see if we actually uh, peel this off to see if it's got a rating printed on it. So, yeah, 1900 milliamp hours. We'll uh, do some power measurements and uh, see how much it actually draws. And so there's a fairly chunky aluminium uh, mount for the lead, so that's going to be providing some heat sinking. And we've got the sort of centre assembly here. Flat flex cable with a connector down onto the main PCB. And we've got a sort of fairly dense probably BGA package there. Probably another one here. And just sort of Damping resistors and various other stuff. So, oops. And there's a, a lead connector there. Let's go a bit further. Right, one nice detail there is actually a, a rubber or a soft. So I think it's probably the same material they've used for the um, the rubber hat side moulding. It means that this, where this meets the top, it, it looks like they have actually made an attempt to get some um, moisture seal in there. So it looks like that's been sort of reasonably well engineered. Yeah, so that, that whole edge is soft. So when this thing is all screwed together, that pretty makes a fairly good um, good seal. So actually that will keep, uh, keep moisture out quite nicely. So the lead is its... I think it's actually metal this. Yeah, this. I think this top bit is actually completely metal. Yeah, it is. Um, so the lead's bonded to that. So this entire front piece actually acts as a heat sink for the uh, lead, which is uh, quite a nice little detail. Yeah, and that actually unplugs, which is uh, good. The sensor plugs in. A little ball to ball connector on there. Whole sensor module just clips in. There's actually a 
second connector here. So the whole electronics assembly comes out as one nice little module complete with the display and this sort of frame here which looks like the frame sort of mounts the display and clips onto the end of the PCB. I'm not sure we've got the uh, buttons there. And the side button for the torch. Okay, so we've got the uh, main PCB out, out here. We've got the main processor here. This is a uh, Texas Instruments AM3358, which is uh, the Citara ARM Cortex A8 processors running somewhere between 600 meg and 1 gigahertz. Now it's not surprising to find quite a powerful chip in here because we know from sort of the previous Seek things they do do quite a lot of processing to get a decent image out of their, their sensor so there's you know, probably quite a lot of processing power going on here. This thing does have a GPU so maybe they're using that as well. Uh, we've got some RAM down here down here there's a Kingston uh, e EMMC which is providing the uh, flash storage. There's a power supply management chip here and there's a spare position here. Now it's not that hard to figure out what this is in that we have sort of some discrete F which is clearly filter and an antenna connector so this is clearly meant for a um, either a Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi option in fact down here we have some test points which say sort of BT underscore so I think that probably uh, means Bluetooth so that there is actually provision on this PCB to have um, Bluetooth and it you know, makes a certain amount of sense they'd maybe have thinking about putting having a Bluetooth version of this uh, product at some point in the future. There's a sort of space there for the, uh, the crystal oscillator for it and there I'm guessing that's probably an SPI flash again probably for the um, to hold the firmware for the uh, Bluetooth processor. Um, up here there's just a 74 uh, LV LVC245 with a thing a bunch of sort of pins saying in sorry um, in so these are probably just various IO stuff perhaps for the uh, buttons and also down here there's um an LPC812 which is a very low end Cortex M0 processor so I think that's probably going to be doing like the on-off power management and probably also controlling the, the LED so that's probably going to be doing the, the dimming for the LED but there are for example the pad is it says FL underscore but which is presumably flashlight but quite a few uh, labelled test points on this thing it's a uh, TPS 65217 so that's just going to be providing the power rails for the processor and the um, memory. Interesting we've actually got marked UART, TX and RX pins which may be for the Bluetooth thing but we'll certainly have a, a quick probe to see if there's anything interesting um, happening on those. Not much on the other side, that's the connector for the display crystal down there, some um, damping resistors which are probably, yeah those would be damping resistors for the um, LCD connect, sorry that's the um, uh, sensor connector not display. And it's all just really decoupling here, nothing uh, exciting going on on this backside. Quite a nice reinforced sort of metal mounting for the micro USB so and that's a very very ruggedly attached with looks like the micro USB is actually soldered into the PCB but it's also sort of reinforced by this sort of metal frame so that's sort of a very nice little detail so that hopefully it'll be very difficult to do any damage by sort of misinserting the um, micro USB so that's um, yeah very nice nicely built little uh, little board and on the, um, the centre assembly there's another LPC8812 which is interesting. Not quite sure why they'd need a, a separate processor just on the um, on the sensor board. There's not really a great deal it's going to be doing. Might, perhaps it's as it might be controlling the uh, shutter. There's the coil for the, um, the calibration shutter. Can't really see a great deal else here. Oops, uh, let's 
It looks like we've got the um, press fit pins for the um, shutter coil that we saw on the, uh, the other seat products. And this is a metal, uh, looks like it's a metal casting. Uh, there's like a rubber, sort of rubberish, soft rubber surround here. Yeah. Interestingly, this, this lens does appear to be screwed in. So, I suppose there might be some potential scope if you can figure out a way of actually unscrewing it from the front. I think this rubber might get in the way, but it's not totally impossible. You might be able to figure out a way to maybe sort of put a couple of little holes and have a key that um, goes in from the front that actually lets you uh, adjust the focus distance. But say for it's not really the tool to buy if you want to do that, but um, it might actually be possible to do in the same way you can do a similar thing on the Fleur E4. You can actually screw the lens out to get close focus. See the sensor down there. Back into the lens. So you see the center, and then what you're seeing there that's actually the shiny bit's the center, and then the black is the shutter in front of it. And this is pretty much what we expect here. Yeah, this is effectively just the center assembly, same sensor, obviously, it's the same sensor die as, the, um, as in the phone product, just mounted on a, its own PCB with the um, with the shutter and not really much else, but so I'm, I'm rather intrigued why they actually went to the effort of putting a sort of whole Cortex M0 processor on this board. I can't really see what they'd need to do here that they couldn't do on the main processor, which seems rather uh, peculiar. Okay, these things are you know they're cheap, but it's hard to think what they'd uh, actually need need it for. So, this is a sort of cast, sort of really chunky casting that's going to be for mechanical stability of the lens to sensor positioning and obviously probably a little bit of thermal mass for just some thermal stability. Now of course if you did want a dedicated tool just for close-up PCB work then you know one option would perhaps to be buy one of these and just screw the lens out and leave it screwed out but I think um, yeah, it would be a bit tricky to adjust this while the things all, all together but say for a one-off adjustment um, it wouldn't, yeah. For example, if you actually wanted to set up something for uh, regular PCB use and nothing else, then this would certainly be a fairly cheap, decent resolution um, option for that. But so you would need to uh, just change this lens focus, adjust to um, get the focus distance right, and the lead uh, holder just screws into this front bezel. So I've just got the reflector assembly do fairly well attached so I'm not going to try uh, taking that out but that's obviously just a single sort of you know one watt type power lead mounted on um, probably an aluminium board again quite nicely uh, nicely engineered there's actually uh, there is a sort of plastic window there as well keep any gunk out in case like I did I forgot which end of this cable was which, it does actually tell you. Let's take a look at the power consumption. So normal running mode about sort of 400 milliamps, so looking at about sort of probably three and a half to four hours life which is pretty reasonable. And the torch, I set the, um, the torch to um, sort of minimum and maximum level, so 100% and about 3%. So full 600 milliamps. So it's probably about sort of a couple of watts or so. It's very very bright and minimum sort of 60 odd milliamps. So fairly negligible. If you're on a minimum basic level of light, that'll last a good sort of sort of probably 24 hours or so. And when it's off. You spend a little bit of time just sort of pulsing something on and off. I 
then it sort of settles down to 40 microamps, which is nothing to speak of, so it's not going to be any uh, sort of shelf life issues where you stick it in your toolbox and come back a while later and find it's flat, so that's uh, fairly good. Right, I've had a quick probe around this thing with the scope. Um, can't find anything on those UART pins, but the only thing I can uh, see is this is some data from the sensor um, from this week, so it looks like it's 16 frames a second pretty much uh, consistently. That's about the only thing uh, I've managed to find of any significance on the board. So quite a nice little handheld unit. Um, Pretty good for sort of general purpose work, but not really recommended for close-up PCB work um, because of the fixed focus lens and there's, you know, this front isn't really amenable to uh, putting a uh, any sort of lens holder on there. So if you're looking for that sort of thing, then you know, this probably isn't the right tool for you. But just as a general purpose camera for sort of building work, you know, electrical work, then. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite a nice unit, it feels nice, it sort of feels quite rugged, it's got a crazily bright torch, you might have noticed this, this torch when you put it on full. Um, just pointed at something for a couple of seconds, you can actually see the heat that it's transferred to that um, object, so a couple of degrees hotter, just pretty from the light, but yeah, it's nice you can turn it down, so it's not going to be sort of crucifying your battery um, if you don't really need the brightness, but the brightness is there if you need it, although so it'd be nice if you didn't have to go through a memory to adjust that if there's some way of perhaps uh, press and hold this or something to get a to maybe step through a few brightness settings rather than to go through a menu. But um, yeah, apart from that, the only the yeah the fast frame rate is quite nice. It makes it a little bit easier when you're sort of what, uh, moving around to try and locate stuff. But the lag is quite noticeable. Um, I can only assume there may be processing a relatively large number of frames to produce each image, which would explain why you know they can do 15 frames a second, but you've still got a uh, quite noticeable um, lag. But you, you you do just about get used to that. But it's probably the only slightly uh, annoying thing about it and uh, in terms of resolution yeah, this is probably by quite a long way the cheapest 320 by 240 thermal imager um, whether this lens is capable of really um, exploiting the whole resolution of the um, its sensor I, I don't really know but um, it does seem to produce sort of fairly sort of nice sort of clear images you got the just a very very slight fixed pattern noise over the top but certainly nothing that's yeah for this price you can't really complain about that I don't think um, as to you know, how this compares to the C2, the Fleur C2, which is its obvious competition, uh, I've not actually used the C2 myself, so I don't quite. I, I'm not really sure how it compares. Obviously, the the thermal resolution and frame rate of this is faster, but you don't have the MSX uh, thermal blending that you have on the um, the C2, which can be helpful sometimes if you're trying to um, figure out what's going on in a complex scene. So the resolution and frame rate of this will, to some extent, make up for that. And so the fact you've got um, manual span and offset if you want it, uh, you've also got a, um, I think the actual temperature range of this is a bit higher than the C2 as well. But um, no, it's quite a nice little unit and perhaps we might see a Bluetooth version in the future but uh, to be honest I'm not really sure how useful Bluetooth will be on a unit like this. I suppose it might be handy to sort of transfer images over Bluetooth but uh, I think it's possibly slightly questionable. How generally useful that would be.